All right, ladies and gentlemen, people of the fine world of food science, we are going to be doing our video on thermal processing computer modeling. And for those of you who are following along with the uh, Cullen 1313 uh, course at Niagara College, we did some live lecture work and I wanted to make sure that you were left with an example video of how to go about doing some of the computer modeling on this process. I also happen to share um, R. Paul Singh's videos on D and Z value with you. And for those of you who are learning food science and going on this journey, um, maybe not part of the uh, Niagara College community, maybe you are a graduate of our program or you're finding this channel through some other means, I highly encourage you to take a look at um, Dr. Paul Singh's channel because he is quite literally the world's leading authority in thermal processing and he's also a fantastic distance educator and has done some wonderful video content. What he hasn't done is actually walk through an application of how it might be done in a CBET type learning environment and those of you who've been following my channel know that I'm a CBET teacher. That means that we focus on competency-based education and training and that's really workforce related. I want you to be able to take all that theory and quickly pivot around and use it in a work-related scenario so that you can turn all that wonderful theory into usefulness and make your product safe, make money for your company, and invent new products that I can then go buy off the shelf and go, hey, that person watched my video, I love them. So what are we going to do today? At the end of this video, you will be able to review D, Z, and T reference values in relation to thermal processing of food products. We'll use an industry standard tool for estimating log reduction of a thermal process, and we'll utilize the tool for both R&D and quality control type applications in food processing. So I spent some time looking through my catalog. One year, when I did the demo, I gave the exact same data set as I had in the assignment, and the students all passed with flying colors, and I'm like, wow, I did such a good job, except that I had demonstrated the exact same data set. So I need to make sure I found the good data set that had not been done in class. So just a quick reminder, our thermal death rate curve is giving us our D value. So on a semi-log graph, so the y-axis is in logarithmic uh, form, and in the x-axis it's going to be linear. You'll note there's no units on here. It's just a schematic here, but what we're seeing is log reduction of 1 over time is going to give us that D value. So time at a constant temperature. The D value is always given a reference temperature. So D value is expressed at a temperature. And something that we talked about in the class was that do make sure that you are collecting your uh, D value reference temperatures and your time temperature logs in the same units or convert one or the other. D value is an absolute temperature. Whereas, so again, the D value is going to kill off one log of your uh, microbial population. That said, it's specific to the organism. So you can't just go in and say, I'm going to have a D value on my total plate count. No, you have to know what is the most resistant organism or what is the pathogen of interest and know which one has the um, more resistant D value and focus on that from a log reduction perspective. The Z value, if you watch Dr. Singh's videos, he'll call it a Z value because he is in California and I'm in Canada. I will call it a Z value. A Z value is the um, range of temperature at which you can change that D value tenfold. So either uh, one log up or one log down. And so a Z value is a range and you will see it expressed as a temperature in its units. And something that I see when students or um, people out in the industry start to do thermal process validation work using uh, this model, they will mix up the Z value as an absolute temperature. And if you're converting it from Celsius to Fahrenheit or from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it's very, very sneaky. And you have to remember it's actually a range of temperature. How do I express... Um, 
understanding the Z value? Well, I always say to my students, um, here I'm in Canada, if you're cooking a hamburger, you, uh, according to our absolute uh, time temperature, not time temperature cutoffs, but uh, internal temperature cutoffs, if you were to cook a hamburger, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency will say, cook it to an internal temperature of 71 degrees. And that's a consumer facing um, output. But if you're in the industry, they'll say, cook the burger until you have a five log reduction of E. coli. Or cook it to 71 degrees, whichever you prefer. And I always ask the students, well, are you still killing the bacteria if you only cook it to 70 degrees? Well, yes. What about 69? Well, yes. The thing is, um, the, the lower the temperature, you start to have a slowing of the lethality rate. Higher the temperature, you're going to speed up the lethality rate. And so that's what the Z value is helping. It's the, it's the, it's um, changing the rate of the equation. Now, the students who are in my program haven't taken calculus, and so it's difficult to do all of the, the math from um, Ball's theorem. And so as such, we focus on instead using calculators that have been produced by the industry. I have the d-value uh, table here that I have produced for, uh, for the class, but I want to actually just, uh, these are d-values for canned products. Let's just jump it. Let's just jump right out into my Excel file here. And again, I'm not going to edit this out because at this point we are we are good friends. Um, okay, here's one. And I know that we're not doing this because that's actually came from the data that was collected last year by the students. This is a calculator put out by the North American Meat Industry Foundation. Um, let me actually scroll up here. And they have given, pardon me, there's all my email. So the Foundation for Meat and Poultry Research and Education is founded by the North American Meat Industry, um, NAMI, North American Meat Industry, and their foundation for um, education and research. And they have provided this spreadsheet. There's a few other organizations that have spreadsheets. Um, AIB has a baking spreadsheet, and you can use the same sort of calculations for looking at lethality of E. coli and salmonella in um, in baked products. So if you're using raw eggs or uh, wheat flour that may be contaminated, you'll know that you have sufficient lethality on the product. The United States Department of Agriculture also has a program called the um, PMP, and that is the uh, predictive model um, Yes, yay, PMP. And back when I went to school, path pathogen modeling program, they have different models that you can use as well. I just happen to really like the one from NAMI. One, I first trained in working at the meat industry, and I just found that this, this Excel file was extremely user-friendly. It was originally designed using data from Juneja and his collaborators, and Juneja was actually the researcher who founded the uh, pathogen modeling program with the United States Department of Agriculture. So the NAMI model is the one I prefer. You can uh, apply a lot of the same principles from it, though. So if you're working in industry, what they're going to recommend, first off, is that you identify what is the pathogen of interest in your product. And every undergrad in microbiology should be focusing on what are the pathogens and spoilage indi uh, in indicator organisms within different types of products? So if I'm making a hamburger, I should be concerned about E. coli. But I may also want to look at salmonella because that may be also a contaminant occurring in there. If it's a hamburger, it's likely going to be a frozen product or a short shelf life refrigerated product. If I'm serving it immediately to a consumer at a food service outlet, though, I would really want to make sure that I've knocked back those pathogens. If I'm making a pre-cooked hamburger and then um, having it in a refrigerated commissary for quick reheating and warming up in a five-day shelf life refrigerated, then maybe I do want to be aware of other spoilage organisms, pseudomonas or so on. So I need to pick my organism of concern. In the case of the NAMI calculator, they actually give you a convenient little table down here. And they give you some indication about these organisms. Um, 
So from there, we need to collect some time temperature data. And you're going to use a data logger or a uh, PLC lined in thermometer into your process. Um, in some cases, people don't have fancy data loggers. Uh, I was showing the students uh, in the class these data loggers used to be quite expensive, and the price point has decreased considerably on them. Um, back when I bought my first set of data loggers for research, I think we paid about $1,000 a piece. And now, 10 years later, they're coming in at a, uh, just under $200, which is quite remarkable, that level of, of um, price reduction. Now, if you are needing it to be NIST calibrated, so absolutely calibrated with certi uh, certifications, then you may be paying more, but it, this is a NIST traceable thermometer and it's capable of being calibrated. So, not a bad strategy. Honestly, too, uh, for many people who are doing basic R&D, especially in small companies, they'll just get a, uh, a calibrated probe thermometer or a calibrated uh, thermocouple and line it out and set a timer and collect data routinely rather than using a time temperature data logger. It's not, not rocket science. Let's jump back to our spreadsheet. So we collected time and temperature data. In the case of the NAMI calculator, they say, ideally, please collect 20 pieces of data. It just happens that this is what we've got. So we're going to work with it anyways. So I've collected that in the spreadsheet. I am making sure, first off, are my units the same? So I've got Fahrenheit, I've got Fahrenheit, I've got Fahrenheit, I've got Fahrenheit. Wait a second. What are these units? These are coming from up here. Oh, and you know what? You note this. We were looking at salmonella, and I'll, I'll tell you what the product was. It was actually a tofurkey. Last year, I had some vegan students in the class, and we were... Uh, doing an assignment and they asked if instead of smoking uh, chickens and hams, could they please smoke a vegan product? And I said, yeah, sure, we can smoke a tofurkey for you. Wait a second, Th I pulled this from um, the student assignment. Do we see the problem already? Mixing numbers. Let's make sure that we've got the right numbers in this set. So the nice thing about this spreadsheet is that you can quickly scroll through the numbers. Uh, so first off, I'm just going to transfer the numbers over. And I want to make sure that I've got the right numbers lined up here in the box. Pardon me, I'm going to scroll out just a tiny bit so that I can see the green box and the uh, numeric table up here. So pardon me, it's a little bit small, but I'll read out the numbers for you. Up here, is, they've given us two different scenarios. and. These are experimentally derived scenarios. So um, Scott and Vedig uh, in 1998 would have done a meat patty um, validation on an actual product and then published that data. The LEMGO database, uh, pardon me, I'm going to open it up. The LEMGO database is fantastic because what they have done is they have compiled literally hundreds of different papers with D and Z values, if you aren't finding the organism or the food system that you want, this is a, a wonderful database of all sorts of papers that have been collected together. Lucky for us, I am going to be concerned about uh, salmonella, and let's, uh, from a, from a R&D or um, product development perspective, something that I want to talk to you about is the fact that you can always make your system way more robust from a statistical process control perspective, you don't have to, if, if the regulatory limit says, we would like to see a 7.5 log reduction of salmonella in poultry products or simulated poultry products, um, we can go way beyond that. We, we can have a 20 log reduction as our operational limit. We can go 40 log reduction. We can make it 4,000 for all that it matters. You just can't go below that log reduction. And so this is the beauty of computer modeling. So let's let's make sure I've got the right numbers in here. So I'm going to get 150. 10 is the Z value. So 150 Fahrenheit was the T reference. 10 was the temperature range for the Z value. And then the D value was 0 0.172. 
and we click enter and boom, 14,000 log reduction of the process. And I always ask the students, so when you see that green box and it says 14,000, how do you feel about this product? I don't say, is this product safe? Is this not, is product not safe? I always, I always ask that question, how do you feel about this product? Because oftentimes you see that number and you're like, what? What the heck is that? And instead of saying, what the heck? You're going to say, you know what? This process is extremely ample for salmonella control and it's sufficient for log reduction to meet regulatory limits. That's it. That's it. Let's try the other number though. The nice thing about these calculators is that you can quickly scroll through a wide variety of different um, experimental data sets and the, the T, ref, Z, and D values you can quickly scroll through and find out, oops, 4.72. It's getting dark here. Note, I chose a different salmonella uh, T, ref, Z, and D value in this time. Now we're not 14,000, but we're still 200. From a, from a thermal process perspective, we took the... Uh, Tofurkey, the fake vegan turkey, and we followed the instructions on the package. If we were setting instructions for this package, we could go back and say, wait a second, if salmonella is our organism of interest, do we need to cook it this long? There may be other functional reasons that we're cooking this long. We're making the assumption that the temperature, the thermometer was set appropriately we're making the assumption that we're not doing this just once. We're going to have statistical process control um, in place by running this multiple times and seeing that we have repeatability on this sort of uh, time temperature data and plot that in a histogram perhaps to see the sort of distribution that we're getting. But we could say, you know what, this thermal process is perhaps too much. And we don't need that much, and it potentially could be reducing the quality of the product. You can, as a product developer, go in from a product development perspective and manipulate these numbers. What would happen if we were to put that turkey in frozen solid? So instead, it's now going in at zero Fahrenheit and 10, 20, 30... 40. And now I, I'm mucking around with these numbers. What I, why am I mucking around with these numbers? Now I know. Uh, I, I'm not doing this from a quality perspective. I'm doing this from an R&D perspective. What would happen to our time temperature if we were to take it straight from fr frozen? And I'm going to bet you anything that the, the cooking instructions at cook it for an hour was specifically for specifically for a frozen solid product. And you'll note that my product came in at the classroom at room, or not at room temperature, at refrigeration temperature. And so when my team built out the cart of equipment for this class, they likely set everything on the refrigeration cart alongside the, the actual poultry products that we tested. And it likely sat at refrigeration overnight and therefore it slacked off. We followed the cooking instructions, but these are the sorts of abuse scenarios that you can, you can play around with. And so be very, very intentional about how you use the data. But as an R&D person, let, if you muck around and say, okay, now we're doing it straight from frozen and we're getting like, what I want to reinforce though, always follow up with secondary experimental data to make sure that you are truly seeing the sorts of, the sorts of uh, numerical um, expressions that are here. Yes, you can go and do uh, diffusivity calculations and so on, but I studied a lot of those diffusivity calculations and then I went out and worked in the real world and everyone was like, ah, no, we do outcomes-based because everything is so variable. And instead we do outcomes-based and statistical process control. That's why I emphasize that so much more than focusing on the theory calculations. I leave the theory to the wonderful people like uh, Dr. Singh and... Um, some other wonderful food scientists who have some great videos. Um, Don Mercer is another one. 
So let's do one more example before I leave you here. I think I had it open. I promise the I promise the students this one, and I'm sure Michael Gray will not mind because he talked about this on Facebook. Um, my friend Michael Gray, who is the corporate chef for W. T. Lynch, which is a uh, food sauce company, he he uh, uh, sent me a, an email back in the springtime saying my wife is having her birthday, and I would really like her to uh, have a wonderful birthday, and we can't go out; it's COVID. I'd like to make her an awesome, awesome hamburger, and I'd like to make sure it's absolutely safe. So how can I make a sous vide hamburger and know that I have five E. coli log reduction? And I said, well, let's let's do a screen share and walk through. So what we did was we used from an R&D perspective. So first off, we said, you know what? E. coli is the organism of interest. Yes, we could go and run all the different numbers and see, do we have, uh, in Canada, it would be 6.5 log reduction of salmonella. 5 log E. coli reduction. That's what we're really looking for in terms of um, process lethality on most RTE meats. Um, and I did exactly exactly as I, uh, as I said before. I'm going to go in and from a, from a purely R&D perspective, what would it look like if I made a burger at ambient temperature? So I pulled the meat from the fridge, shaped it into a patty, and then by six minutes... In a sous vide system, it has met internal temperature at 133 degrees Celsius. How long do we need to go before we finally get five log reduction? <laughs> we had a ton of fun with this. And you'll note, I had to stretch out the time limit to um, close, close to 80 minutes to get that log reduction of five so that Michael Gray's lovely wife could have a uh, rare hamburger. He then took the burger and just did a very fast sear in the pan. It was juicy and red, and he said his wife was absolutely beside herself. Uh, best burger she'd had in the longest time. This is what I mean, that you, you can use this as a quality control tool. And so if you were, let's say, running a food service outlet and saying to your uh, municipal health inspector, we are going to do sous vide burgers and we have an alternative process, and we have a process validation on that alternative process, you could walk out there with this type of data. And the thing is, then you have to back it up. So from an R&D perspective, we can muck around and throw in numbers in here and say, here's what I think that process should look like. Now you have to back it up with actually collecting the data for real, for sure, put a temperature probe in on a, on a septum, and track the temperature of that burger for, for real and know that now you're collecting this kind of data from a quality control purpose. So I always say to my students when doing this work, if you own this work and you really do it well, in the beginning, I highly recommend working with someone who has some expertise in this field to double check your work because if you make a mistake in this, you can make a big mistake in this and you can kill people. You can have recalls. You can have big problems of people getting sick. If you own this process and you start to really know what you're looking for and uh, do it well over and over and over again, you can save a ton of money in microbiology. You still need to back up and do absolutely all of the mandatory microbiology testing. But let's say, for example, you have a HACCP plan and you say, you know what, HACCP plan says my burger must be cooked to um, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And for some reason, your product only got to 155. If you have time temperature data being collected, you can run those numbers. And if your product did not meet the critical limit within your HACCP plan, uh, the process control or CCP, whatever you, uh, whatever terminology you're using, um, if you have this sort of time temperature data, you can backstop and in many cases be able to release your product without issue because you can say, you know what, we've got time temperature data on this product. Modeling shows the product's disposition is more than adequate. In this case, it was a one-off burger. If I was doing this at food service, I would likely be wanting to get not just five log reduction, I'd likely be wanting 10 log 
12 log reduction because that one time the food service operator doesn't pay attention and has a deviation, we're still well beyond um, normal um, statistical or common cause variation that would be occurring within the process. So those of you who are following along at the college, you've got a whole pile of files and I want you to have some fun with them and do some modeling. And then next week, I think we're going to actually run the smokehouse and collect some of this data, uh, have some fun together, um, socially distancing, making some smoked meat. Ask lots of questions. I love to hear from you and take care and have fun modeling process lethality.